I always, I, I always think of the fact that when, when an atheist says, I don't believe in God, I, I answer, well, well, what God don't you believe in? And they'll say, well, the, the big old white man in the sky who judges everybody. I'm like, I don't believe in that God either. Um, to, to when people ask me if I believe in God, it's not a simple answer because we as human beings don't have any concept of what God is. And, and the more I understand about the nature of the universe and where we come from, the more I understand that I don't know. Um, we are created beings. We are, I believe the universe is created. We are created. We are designed there. The, the God that we talk about is love. The Bible says, you know, God is love. And it's funny because it doesn't say God is like love or God has a lot of love. It says God is love. My guest today is Brian Smith. As a young man, he was deeply scarred by toxic religion which among other things instilled in him an intense fear of death, a fear that his lifelong spiritual quest has now relieved. Unexpectedly, his daughter Shayna passed from this life and into the next at the age of only 15 and a half. With Shayna's passing, he experienced the most profound loss anyone can suffer. After Shayna's transition, his spiritual quest intensified, prompted by the extraordinary visions and messages he received from her after her death. And as a result of those experiences, he immersed himself in researching concepts of the afterlife, taking a scientific as well as a spiritual and philosophical approach to it. He needed to know, not just believe. Brian, Thank you so much for being my guest. I appreciate you coming on so much. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. And first of all, I want to express my condolences for the loss of your daughter. That must have been incredibly hard. And there's no words that can take away the pain or heal us. But I hope that she has brought some gifts to you. And, and it sounds like she has. Yeah, she definitely has. Um, you know, losing someone, um, and I hate, even hate the, to use the word losing someone, but losing the physical presence of someone is is not easy. Um, it's it's really it's really hard. But there are silver linings. There are things that that come along. There are gifts that we can that we can get from it. It's been almost nine years now, so things have um, things change over time. Uh, we continue to grieve in a way, but it's it's different after, you know, after that long. You struggled with the concept of religion basically your entire life. You were in mm -hmm. a lifelong search for what reality really is, what what religion is, spirituality. And at the passing of your daughter, you realized you didn't want to believe anymore. You needed to know. So how did that lead you to where you are now? Well, for me, um, as you kind of mentioned in the introduction, I was raised in a home where I was taught about uh, a God who was uh, vindictive, who was judgmental. And I remember being a kid and just looking around the planet and going, why am I, why am I even here? Um, I, I grew up uh, in the early six, I was born in the early sixties. So so my earliest memories were like the Vietnam War on TV. And I'm like, why do people kill each other? And being being a black man or a black boy at the time, like, why don't people like me because of my skin color? I just, I just really didn't understand what was going on on this planet to begin with. And then my grandfather was the pastor of our church. And so I go to, you know, I go to church and I hear that, well, you're born in sin. You're you're born sinful. And that um, you have to be saved, uh, otherwise God's going to send you to hell for eternity. And God killed His own Son to save you, and you're a disgusting, you know, person. Uh, everybody is, not just you, but everybody is. And again, those those messages just didn't make a lot of sense to me. And I looked at this God, and I'm like, kind of a person monster, really, would tor torment people for believing the wrong thing. Because we were taught, we were very exclusive. It was like, if you weren't part of our church, you were going to hell. If you were Catholic, you were going to hell. If you were, you know, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever. It was like anybody that wasn't part of this particular faith. 
So uh, that instilled a, a great deal of fear into me. And I, I was like, so I was in my early 20s, my mid 20s, when my uncle was actually murdered. And uh, my uncle was gay, and he wasn't part of the church. And so again, it was like, okay, well, this part, so now it became very personal, because this was the first person I knew that that said, my doctor said, this person's in hell. And I just could not accept that. So I started like, what does the Bible really say? So I did a lot of studying about early church history, about where the Bible came from, excuse me, about the Council of Nicaea, you know, all these different things. And I learned that the Christianity that I've been taught was only one very narrow slice of Christianity. It was actually relatively new. Um, the whole idea about the rapture, for example, I found that wasn't invented till like the 1800s. And I thought it was, you know, in the Bible. Um, the, I, so I learned a lot about my faith and I started, and then I discovered something called Christian universalism, which is the idea that Jesus atones for all of our sins, not just not just Christians, not just particular people, but the Jesus atonement was for everyone. So that was a step away from that judgmental God for me. It was like, well, okay, well, at least he's going to save everybody. Um, so I was feeling a lot better about myself, you know, as a human being, that God didn't hate me. Feeling better about how God, you know, viewed the world, et cetera. And then in 2015, when my daughter was 15 and a half, uh, she passed away suddenly. So um, it was just, she was healthy. She was happy. She was a great, great girl. And she went to bed on one night and didn't wake up the next day. Um, so it was, it was literally just that sudden that she was gone. So now all these things that I had believed and learned and studied, and well, now I have to apply those. And I was still more of the belief that when we die, we go to heaven, you know, we're just, and then we see each other maybe, you know, later on when we all are there, but didn't really understand this ongoing connection that we can have with people who have, who have, who have passed over or transitioned. So I discovered a group called Helping Parents Heal. And through that group, I learned about this, this thing called continuing bonds, that we can still have relationships with our loved ones that they still care about us, they're still connected with us, they still love us, and we don't have to wait, you know, for however long it's going to be before we see them again. So that's um, that's the kind of point that I am I'm at today. And that, again, that was, you know, nine years ago, it'll be nine years in June. And about three years ago, I decided to kind of say, okay, I want to help help other people understand this. So I became a, a life coach and a certified grief educator and that's what I do today is try to help people to, to navigate that, uh, those losses. Well, I think it's remarkable for you to have taken such a deep and great loss of your own and transform that into something light and beautiful to gift upon others. That's an amazing transformation um, from the darkness to the light. And thank you so much for being that resource and being that shoulder for others. I know it's really hard to lose someone that you want and you, or that you love and you do not ever want to see other people have to go through that as well. Shana sent you some visions and messages after her death. Do you want to tell us about what happened there? Well, it's she sends me messages in lots and lots of different ways. I mean, from the traditional things you think about dream visits. So I've had dream visits with her. Um, I've had a, f a few and, and not as many recently. Um, but for me, I mean, when, people, when you have a dream visit, typically the person appears healthy, happy, whole. Um, for me, because I loved having my girls, the little girl, Shana usually comes to me, she's younger. So she's usually like five or six around that age. Um, she was 15 when she passed. Uh, but Shana never wanted to grow up either. She always said, I don't want to grow up. So it would, it would make sense that she would present to be younger. So things from, like I said, dream visits, um, signs like finding coins. Uh, one, one example is she passed away in June. And in August, we took a vacation, just the three of us, her sister, my wife, and I. Uh, we went just away for a weekend to try to I kind of readjust or adjust to being the three of us because that was a, it was a really weird experience. And I remember I get up early every, every morning and I walk and I got up early that morning 
and I was going to, I was going to go for a walk before my wife and my other daughter got up. And I said to Shane, I was like, I need a sign from you today. You know, it's, this is really tough. Cause again, this is like eight weeks after she had passed. And first time I really asked her for a sign, I said, so let's do dimes. So people find pennies and stuff. Let's do dimes. That's that'll be our thing. So if I find a dime, I know it's a sign from you. So I, I go back to the hotel room. We get ready to go and we're going to catch a, a, a van to go to the ferry to go across this Island. My wife and daughter get in the van ahead of me and I decide to get into the second row. So I bend my head down to get in the second row. And as I, as I bend down, look underneath the seat, there's a single dime sitting right there under the seat. And that was the first sign I can remember that she sent me. And since then it's been dimes and feathers and birds and butterflies and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and on and on, I mean, she, she messes with my computer. She messes with my phone. Uh, she turned the ceiling fan on in our bedroom. Um, she does, she like does little things like that. She's kind of a jokester. So, um, I remember one time she, my computer just started acting weird and my, I thought my heart drive was going out. So I called the guy that works on my computers and I said, you know, this is acting really weird. And he goes, well, I think you're going to need a new computer. I'm like, well, I shouldn't need a new computer. It's just the hard, but it's very sporadic. It would work sometimes. It wouldn't work other times. And I finally said, Shana, if this is you messing with my computer, stop it. And then it started working and it worked like perfectly. It never had, never had another problem after that. And then the confirmation of that a couple of weeks later, I had a, had a reading with the medium and she was talking about Shana and the science. She, could, she said, one of the things Shana says she does is she messes with your computer. And I'm like, that was my validation that that wasn't just a coincidence. Well, I, I do want to say this to people. I, I do work with people that are in grief and sometimes they'll look at me, for example, and say, well, you're such a strong person. I'm no stronger than anybody else. We all have a lot more strength than we think that we do. And when we go through something like this, I believe two things happen. One is it reveals the inner strength that we already have. And also it does make us stronger. It's just like if you go to the gym and you lift weights, you become a stronger person. So this this is a this is a weight that you carry around. And after a certain period of time, you do you do get stronger. So um, but I'm no different than anybody else. And I remember when I when Shana first passed, I was like, I'm gonna be miserable for the rest of my life. That's gonna I'm gonna dedicate myself to being miserable. And when people are gonna say he was never the same after his daughter passed away. And one of my ancestors is actually Thomas Jefferson. And I, I'd heard that he had said this when his when his first wife, when his wife passed away. It's like, this is the way I'm gonna I'm going to honor her. And I happened to go to a meeting of parents who had lost children, and there was a woman there, and it had been about 10 years since her daughter passed, and this woman was miserable. She was just like angry, she was bitter, she was dark. Everybody in the room felt worse for having been in the room with her. And I thought to myself, I can't do that. I can't do that to the people around me. I can't do it to my daughter. I can't do that to my wife, my my friends. I don't want to be that kind of force in the world. So if I'm going to be here, and I wasn't convinced I wanted to be here, but if I'm going to be here, I've got to move past this. I can't, I can't live like this. And so I made a a commitment to myself and and to my daughter, actually to Shana, that I would that I would uh, work on healing. And I know that our loved ones and spirit don't want us to be sad forever. They know they understand that we're sad. They understand that we miss them, but they don't want us to be miserable. And if we think about it, if we if we flip it around, if it was us on the other side, we wouldn't want our loved ones to be miserable. We'd say, go ahead, be happy, live, you know, live your life. And I'll I'll see you when you get here. So I I Shane and I are a team, and I feel like you know it wasn't really a choice. And I've also realized that I've gotten older that there's something called life planning or soul planning. And I believe everything in my life set me up for this. Uh, I remember my like I said, my grandfather was a pastor. Both of his parents were pastors. And my whole life I had this this really weird thing that I should be teaching. I should be preaching. And but I was like, no, not Christianity. I'm not, I'm not preaching that. And so when Shana when Shana passed away, I'm like, okay, I think this is what I was being set up for, was to do the thing I'm doing now. So I, I consider what I do to be a ministry of sorts, not in the religious sense, but in the spiritual sense. How did this change your life from 
receiving these messages and these signs from her and talking to mediums and knowing that she's still in your life. How has that changed you moving forward? And you said that you didn't want to be miserable. So you, you turned that around as well. Mm -hmm. It literally changes the way you look at everything. Um, you know, we, we, we get so attached in this world to, to our bodies, to the material stuff around us, to everything around us. And, um, the movie, the matrix is probably the, one of the best analogies I can think of in, in the movie, the matrix, they realize that the world they're living in is not, is not real, that it's a simulation and the world that we live in. It, I, I don't like to say it's not real because it it is real. It does have real consequences, but it's not the ultimate reality. And when, when you realize when you have people on the other side, like I do now, um, that that's where we come from, that that's our home, that this is a, you might want to call it a school, you might want to call it a gym, you might want to call it a, an adventure, like a vacation. If you want to, some people, I think spirits look at it that way. They're like, let's go there and have fun. Let's, wouldn't it be great if we had this? And I'll never forget because Shana, when she was young, she said, I want to break my leg. And we're like, Shana, why would you want to break your leg? Don't say things like that. She said, well, I just want to know what it's like to walk on crutches. And that was the way that she experienced life. She always, even though she only was here for 15 years, she lived everything the full. She always wanted to experiment, ex experience things. And um, so I view this world now as like, we come here for a reason. We come here for, it's a very short period of time. It's, I know it feels like forever when we're in it, but it's a very, very short period of time. And we come here to have these adventures, but this isn't the ultimate reality. So that's the way I view everything now. And I try to view things with a, uh, a curiosity, like when something happens, like, okay, why is this happening? What is this here to teach me? Or, or, and even if you don't believe that, if you don't believe in, in soul planning necessarily, what can I learn from this? Everything that happens is an experience that I can learn from. And there's a, there's a story I, I love. It's a story about this, this farmer and he finds a stallion. It's a wild stallion and all the neighbors come rushing up and they say, it's great. You found the stallion. You know, it's, you're such a fortunate, you're so lucky. And then the next day, his son is out trying to break the stallion. And his son breaks his leg. And the neighbors all come around and they say, You're, this is so unfortunate. It's so unlucky your son broke his leg. You know, this is a terrible thing. And the farmer goes, well, we'll see, maybe. The next day, the army comes through and they're conscripting people into the army. But because the son has a broken leg, he can't go. And the farmer says, they come back around and say, well, it's lucky he couldn't go to the army because he broke his leg. And the farmer is like, I'm not going to judge circumstances. I'm going to wait and see how things play out. And as I get older, I realize that's the way our lives are. We go through these experiences and we say, this is bad. This is good, but we don't know the ultimate outcome. Um, and so everything in my life that I thought was bad is always something good has come out of it. Whether it's getting fired from a job, whether it's getting divorced, you know, wh whatever, when my parents took me out of the school I was in when I was 12 years old, and I thought it was the end of the world, all those things ended up turning out okay. And the way I look at my life now is, ultimately speaking, when I when I cross back over, all these troubles that I go through, the the love will be left, the memories will be left, the lessons will be left, but the pain goes away. And so that's the way I try to live life now. And you grew up in your the beginning of your life knowing a god that did not resonate with your morals with your beliefs do you still believe in god and how has that if you do how has that god changed for you yeah that's a great question um i would I, I always think of the fact that when when an atheist says i don't believe in god i, I answer what well, what god don't you believe in and they'll say, well, the, the big old white man in the sky who judges everybody. I'm like, I don't believe in that God either. Um, to, to when people ask me if I believe in God, it's not a simple answer because we as human beings don't have any concept of what God is. And, and the more I understand about the nature of the universe and where we come from, the more I understand that I don't know. Um, we are created beings. We are, I believe the universe is created. We are created. We are designed. There, the, the God that we talk about is love. The Bible says, you know, God is love. And it's funny because it doesn't say God is like love or God has a lot of love. It says God is love. 
people that have near death experiences come back and they tell us everything is love. If if there is God, there's, there's love. But I don't believe that God is a being. And I'm, you know, I, I remember very early on, I was starting to study this stuff. It's like, you know, I guess I'll never see God uh, because God, I'm not going to walk in the room and there's going to be like God sitting on a throne. I don't believe God is that, that type of a being. Um, but I absolutely believe in all the best attributes that people talk about love and caring and compassion, and that we are immensely loved and we are, we are cared for. Um, that's where we all came from. And is God like the collective aspect of us all put together? I don't know. We're all, are we all made of God? Yeah, we absolutely are. I mean, everything that is, is God. It's like God took God's self and created everything that is out of God. So there's nothing that's not God. So it's a very long winding answer, I guess. But I, I, the God of Christianity, the God I was taught about is way too small. That's, that's, no, I don't believe in that at all. That's a good transition with you talking about the collective. Is God the collective? So a lot of near-death experiencers come back talking about oneness. Mm -hmm. Would you get that same sense of oneness from your experiences and your research? Yeah. There's only one. Uh, I forgot who said it. It was a philosopher. said, there's only one mind in the universe. We are all part of the same mind. We are all part. There's. It's one. We're all it's all one presenting as many different things it's, it's as if god said to know myself i need to have something else to to like to like play off of we have to, to know hot we have to know cold to know love we have to know fear to know anything we have to know something different so why well, try to help people it's like if you think of the analogy if if everything there was nothing outside of you. You couldn't experience yourself. We experienced myself. I experienced myself because I see you over there and I see my computer there and I see my, my walls around me. And so I know that I am all, I'm not all those things. Um, but as far as my body goes, it all feels like it's all the same thing. So I think God to experience what God wanted to experience divided God's self into all the things that we are. So we're all one, but we're all unique at the same time. Do you think that is so God can have different experiences or us as a collective, we can experience everything that there possibly is, like you said, kind of like a playground or vacation here. Yeah, Earth. I don't, you know, it's funny because we try to figure out what's the ultimate meaning of life. And I don't know that we know the answer or ever will know the answer. I think part of it is experience. Part of it is growth because we grow from the experiences we go through. Um. You know, again, we were taught by this, and actually it's a Greek idea of God, that God was perfect. We were taught in Sunday school, God is perfect. God is self-contained. God knows everything. Well, I don't, I don't believe that anymore. I think that God is learning. God is growing. Consciousness is growing. So as we experience and as we grow, we grow the collective consciousness. So we all, and that gives us all a mission. I mean, we all have responsibility to each other to fulfill as best we can what our mission is here and to learn and to grow and explore. So we say, well, what would it be like to, again, like I think about Shana, what would it be like to break my leg? What would that feel like? Um, what would it be like to, um, I, I was interviewing a guy for my podcast and he was talking, we were talking about the meaning of life and we were saying all the same things. People always say, you know, it's, it's education, it's, it's growth, it's learning, et cetera. He goes, part of it is feeling abandoned. And I said, what? I've never heard that before. Because yeah, we that feeling of separation, that feeling of not being totally connected, we come here to experience that so that we can appreciate the love we have on the other side. And I'm like, that just blew my mind. And the more I think about it, it, it makes sense. I think we we do want to know a little bit what's, what it's like to be alone. You touched on soul contracts or soul planning. Mm -hmm. Can you go in a little deeper about that? Yeah, um, I don't like the word soul contracts because we think of like legally binding agreements and we sit there and we sign and it, it, um, but I do believe there's soul planning. I believe there's soul agreements. I believe we have, um, we sit down with our guides and our loved ones before we come in and we kind of lay out a, an overall plan. 
Um, again, it's one of those things that gets really deep, really fast because some people say, well, everything's planned out. Other people say, well, there's free will and people get debates, whether it's one or the other, I think it's actually a combination of both. Um, but I do believe we have overall things that we want to hit. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, for example, I believe that Shane and I had an agreement that this is the way it was going to work out that in this incarnation, this time around that she was going to leave early, um, so that, I could grow so that other people could grow so she could do what she's going to do from where she is. You know, maybe Shana was an advanced soul. I believe she is and said, okay, I only, I only need 15 years this time. You know, I've, I've, I've done this all before. I, so the, I, I absolutely believe that. And it's really wild because before Shana passed, I'd never heard of anything like soul contracts or soul planning. And the irony is that, I do believe it now, you know, after having the, the most tragic event of my life, but I believe that event was set up for something else. Do you believe that we have soul families that we stick around with for, I don't know, a million years and then move on or are they forever? Yeah, I do believe we have soul groups that we, that we, incar we tend to incarnate, incarnate with. Um, doesn't mean everybody in your biological family is part of your soul group. Uh, it does. Yeah. I think people that are in our soul group can come in and out of our lives. So, but I do believe we, we have groups of people that we, we tend to see over and over again and we do hang out with together. I don't know that they're, they're permanent. Um, and permanent is really weird because again, we think of time as humans, we have no concept of how, how old we actually are, how ancient we are. I was reading a book recently. This guy was talking about we go through this. He calls it the grand cycle. So we'll re we'll reincarnate several times on the physical plane, and then we'll reincarnate several times on the astral plane. And then we go to the causal plane, and there there are like seven planes just in this universe, and we it, it's like several million years just to go through that cycle. So uh, so when we talk about permanent. I don't know if they're permanent or not, but I think they last a very long time. And time really isn't what. We feel here on Earth, you touched on that as well. Um, feels like we're here for a very long time, but it's a, in actuality a very short time. And that makes sense if we're reincarnating in all these different planes of existence just in this universe. Who knows how many other universes there are? Yeah, it, it's funny because people will describe it as, as infinite. And, you know, is there a difference between infinite and just so large I can't imagine it? Um, so it's, 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 I, I do know it's so large. I can't imagine it. I, I know that much. Um, so infinite, I think infinite is, is maybe, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's even a real thing, but yeah. And, and time is another thing that's really weird because we know what time is like in our universe. And even physicists in our universe will tell us that time doesn't really exist. They're like, we don't understand what it is. We don't understand why we experience. We don't understand why it flows forward instead of backwards, but it's a construct of this plane. And um, as I've studied more on other planes, I think there is time as much as there is here, but it's very, very different. So we can maybe, for example, travel through time and we can experience it different and we experience it differently than we do here. So um, it gets to be really, it can be very confusing and mind blowing, but it's kind of fun to ponder. So you are a grief guide and a mental fitness trainer. Can you tell me more about what that entails yes what i do in terms of being a grief guide is i help people to reframe things um when we go into the early part of grief and, and grief can be any loss it could be the loss of a, of a job it could be a loss of a pet it can be the loss of a relationship so it could be any kind of loss we typically think about it in terms of losing a people a, a person so when we lose a person we lose that physical connection our, our brains tend to think, okay, they're gone. I know this. I know them as this body, this body's gone They're Therefore they're gone. And therefore I should grieve. Of course. Um, I help people try to understand that while their physical presence is gone, their spirit, the thing that makes them who they are, the thing that you love about them is not gone. And not only is it not disappeared, you know, um, it's not even like way off in heaven. As my medium friends say, they're like right here. They're right next to you. Uh, one of my friends says heaven is three feet off the floor. 
So I try to help people say, I can continue to have a relationship with them. I don't have to wait till I die. I can learn how to connect with them now. I can I can lessen the grief that I have. Now, I, I don't want to let people think or make people think it means I don't have to go through grief. It doesn't mean that I'm going to get over it. I mean, I still miss my daughter. I still think about her every single day. I still think about her physical presence. And that will always happen as long as I'm in the body because that's natural. As human beings, we we tend to crave physical things. But I help people, again, try to reframe that. And, and then the mental fitness part of it is that is the ability to make that switch. Because we, we don't, we're not going to ever stay there all the time. We're, we're, we're going to be drawn back to the human, we're drawn back to the physical. So when I get drawn back to that, and I get drawn back and get sucked into the story, how quickly can I recover? How quickly can I say, this is not the truth, this is not the real story, and I need to move into that other mindset? You received a lot of messages from your daughter and signs and symbols that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that something that anyone can have access to or to to invite into their life? Yes, absolutely. It, it was funny because you, you asked that question just a little little while ago in my community. Someone asked me the question, why doesn't everybody experience, you know, these things? Um, and there's, there's several answers to that. Um, the first is, you're never going to experience it if you think it's impossible. Um, so give you an example. I, there's a song that we, that Shana, that we started listening to after Shana passed away, that became our song. And a lot of times we'll be somewhere and that song will come on and I'll take that as a sign. And now it's been nine years, so it's more rare, but so now when the song plays, it's really a sign, right? So it's because it's a nine-year-old song. So for me, that's a sign. And for me, I, I take that. Now, for a person that doesn't understand or believe in signs and synchronicities, they hear the song, they're not even going to think about it. It's not, so it doesn't exist for them. Um, you know, a cardinal landing on my on my deck or the butterfly that played with my daughter, Kayla, after her sister passed for half an hour on the deck and, you know, was coming back and landing on her finger. You know, that was, we took it as a sign, but for somebody else, they just say that that butterfly was acting really weird. So that's one reason why people don't experience it. Um, and, and deep grief can block the ability to, excuse me, to experience that. Um, so what you can do is start to open up your understanding, understand what a sign and synchronicity is, ask for them, be intentional about it. Um, when you go to bed at night, ask for, ask for a dream visit, for example, um, acknowledge when you do get signs, you know, thank your loved one for giving you the, the sign. So they, you know, again, if you think about it, if your loved one's in spirit and they're sending you signs all the time, and you never respond, then they're probably going to stop doing it. And from my understanding, it takes a lot of energy for people on the other side to send those signs and they have to learn how to do it. So it's important that we, we acknowledge that. So yeah, anybody can experience it. And I've realized as I've talked to people, a lot of times they'll say, well, I don't get signs and synchronicities, you know, like you do. And then we'll talk, well, there was that one time I, I, I found the dime or yeah, I did have this really great dream about my loved one. And they were, it was like, they were right there with me and they were happy and they were telling me they were okay. Um, or, um, they'll tell me about a synchronicity they had in her life. You know, it's like, I can't believe the timing of this. And I'm like, okay, you are getting them. So it's, it's a matter of opening up our eyes and seeing them and a matter of, again, being open to the possibility. Do you think that's because of the way we were raised in our society in the States in particular, and with Christianity, it's kind of taboo to talk about communicating with spirits or anything really afterlife. Do you think maybe that kind of blocks it off for us? That is one of my big pet peeves. You know, I, I get a lot of times on my videos on YouTube, I'll get these comments about near death experiences are all alive from the devil, or this person didn't mention Jesus. Therefore, this is from Satan. And, and I have a lot of friends who are mediums and they'll hear, well, you, you're not supposed to talk to the dead. There's so much wrong with that. It's hardly you know where to begin. First of all, we are spirits. We are spirits that happen to have a body. We are not bodies that have a spirit. So we are we are spiritual beings. Why shouldn't we be able to contact other spiritual beings? That's what we are. 
we, you and I do it through our mouths because we happen to be in the body. But if I, if we could do it telepathically, why wouldn't we do that? And if a person happens to leave their body, that doesn't mean it's taboo for us to talk to them. They just happen to be out of their body. Um, and we have to talk to them in a different way. The other thing is the Bible doesn't forbid mediumship the way a lot of people think it does. I have, I have several medium friends that are devout Christians. One I can think of in particular who is a very devout Catholic. And when his gift opened up, he freaked out. He's like, God, is this you? He prayed about it. He, you know, he studied about it. And he has a whole different interpretation of the Bible now. I've, I've had him on my program a couple of times to talk about it because that's a fear-based mentality that says we shouldn't be able to, to talk to our loved ones that have crossed over. Also, we pray to spirits. We pray to Jesus. We pray to God. Some people pray to saints. You know, Catholics really big about praying to saints. What are saints? They're people that have left their bodies. So it's okay to pray to a saint, but it's not okay to pray to your grandmother. You know, you can't communicate with your grandmother or your mother. So it just, again, it, it doesn't make sense to me. And it's it's a very fear-based thing. Um, also, I know the kind of healing that a medium reading can bring to people and has brought to people. Um, and there've been some informal studies and some a little bit more formal where people said going to a medium was like a year's worth of therapy for me, being able to sit down and, and communicate with my loved one. I was just talking with someone yesterday. I was interviewing about their experience with a particular medium. And they said, it was like having a three-way conversation with my son. It was like, she was there, the medium, I was here, my son was there. And I couldn't hear my son, but she was speaking for him. And her face just lit up as she talked about it. So why would, why should we been, be denied that? Um, I think it's crazy. How has this changed your view of death? Well, my, the short answer is there's no such thing as, as death. Um, the way that people perceive it, we think of, I mean, death means the cessation of life, the end of life. There is no opposite of life. We are, we are eternal beings. The, what dies is the body. So does the, does the body cease? Yes. Which is interesting because it doesn't really, it just goes in a different form, right? Nothing's ever destroyed. The body just moves in the different forms and, and is reconfigured. But yes, we, we do leave our bodies. Um, and I, so I view that as like, the way I look at it now is it's like waking up from a dream. When, when I'm in my dream at night, my dream feels very, very real. I mean, and I, I'm having more lucid dreams the more I think about it this way, but sometimes I'll be in my dream and I'll think, oh, that's really pretty real. I'm, and I'll look around and I'm like, that, that sun feels warm. This is pretty cool. This world that I've created in my mind, because I know I'm dreaming. And when I wake up in my bed, I'm like, okay, well now this is the real world. Um, that's the way I think it is when we, when we die. We, we close our eyes on this side <clears throat> from the world's perspective. So I've talked to many people who have near-death experiences, and they say, I never lost consciousness. I mean, you think about, you like, you lose consciousness. They're like, no, I was here, and then I was there. I was here, then I was in the tunnel. I was here, and then I was above my body. It was like, it's never a loss of consciousness. Like, it was like, if they talk about blackness, they talk about the void, but they were still conscious. So the way I view death now is death is a transition. Death is going home. Um, there's a, a song I love by Stephanie Mills from uh, the movie The Wiz. Um, called, it's called Home. And I think of death as going home. I think of death as, again, waking up from the dream. It's a really cool dream we're having. And, and, it's, it, it, and it, it's fun. You know, it's, it's cool that we get to do this. We get to have this adventure. But it's, this is just... This is a side trip. This is just an adventure. Are you afraid of death? No, no. You know, it's funny because I have to be very careful about this because people think it's morbid when you talk about death and you don't fear it and you look and you say you look forward to it. Oh, no, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't look forward to death. We fear what we don't know. And the more we lean into it, the more we understand it. Why would we fear it? Why would I fear going home. Uh, uh, Peter Panagor, who's had a near-death experience, and, and he's done many, many podcasts and stuff, he, he said, you know, being here is like living in the gutter when you have a mansion, you know, waiting for you. So yeah, this is, I, I'm going to do my best while I'm here and everything. But no, I, why would I fear 
waking up from the dream? Why would I fear going home? Why would I fear seeing my daughter again? No. It goes along with what you were saying, how possibly this world is like a dream. We never want to go to bed and have a terrible nightmare. We always want to have pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. We make the, the most of what this is here. We have the best time that we can. And then when we wake up, there we are somewhere else. So I really yeah. like that that philosophy. It's it's not saying we're we're excited about death or we're looking forward to death, but we're, you know, just living moment to moment, trying to make the, the best of the life that we have. Yeah. I, I like what Paul said in the Bible about, you know, when I'm in the body, I'm with the Lord, and when I or when I'm out of the body, I'm with the Lord. Um if we start to really view this world the way that the way I do, I mean, I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a purpose. This is not, it's not punishment. It's not all just fun. I do have, I do have a job to do while I'm here and I want to do the job the best I can, but there's, there's no loss when I, when I cross over. We, the reason why people fear death is because they perceive it as a loss and it's not, it's a gain. You know, I, I think the only thing we lose is we lose, maybe we lose the ego because we need the ego while we're here in the body. We need the ego to protect us. And so, but we still, we're still the same person we were, have the same, you know, the same sense of humor that we had, the same things that we liked that, you know, we, we don't become different. We don't lose anything. And even I think about it in the old Christian tradition, you know, like, oh, we're going to be angels sitting on harps, you know, playing or sitting on clouds, playing harps and, uh, I'll never forget when I was younger because my mother um, hates milk and she's not a big fan of honey. And she goes, the Bible says, you know, there's milk and honey. I don't like milk or honey. And streets of gold sound gaudy to me. I don't want to be any place with streets of gold. Um, no, heaven is heaven is cool. Heaven is all the great things you can think of here. You know, um, there's some people say, oh, well, in heaven, you can't eat anymore. You can't hug anybody. Eh, I don't believe that. I think everything here is a shadow of what we're going to have when we go back. So eating would be intensified a million times better, or who knows, and hugging would feel like something we can't even describe. That's that's what I've heard. And and then I, I think, you know, maybe we move past the point where we eat. I've heard that people do get to that point. But if you're someone that really likes to eat or you like to cook, um, I think you still get to do that. And, and I think about the um, Leslie Flint, he, he was a physical medium that used to bring through these spirits in, in these seance rooms. And the people would ask them things like, well, can you still have a cigar or can you still like drink? And, and the, the spirits would just start laughing. They're like, of course, of course I can do all that. My world's just as solid as your world is. You know, I, 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 I go fishing every day. So I think we can do what we want. Again, we might some point move past, like, I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to eat it. And I've heard people do get to that point. But if you get there and you really want to have something to eat, I think you can. You talked about this uh, not being a punishment here on earth. Mm -hmm. And we talked earlier about the vengeful God. Do you believe in heaven versus hell? Is hell something that we need to be concerned about? Yeah, that's a great question. And I try, I try to be very thoughtful about stuff. I don't want to just like say everything's great. Nothing bad ever happens because we, we live in a place where we see bad things happening every day. Uh, and I try to account for all the data. So I will say this, like when we come to like near death experiences, 80 or 90% of them are, are pleasant. They're very, they're very good. Um, when I've talked to my medium friends, they're like, I've never brought through anybody who's stuck or anybody who's, you know, feeling guilty or whatever. So some people take that. And I've heard some people go as far as let's say there are no negative emotions on the other side. That doesn't make sense to me. If we can have negative emotions here, we should be able to have negative emotions there. I think we have a very different perspective. So negative emotions tend to fade away because like now I see the big picture. For example, the guy that killed me didn't really kill me because I'm not dead. So I think it's a very different perspective. In terms of hell, I've, I've interviewed a couple of people that have had hellish near-death experiences because I want to know like what is what happened to you. And I've studied them quite a bit. Of all the ones I've ever studied, well, first of all, nobody ever stayed in hell eternally because they're back here. So that that negates the eternal hell if, if they were in eternal hell. I heard one woman say, I was falling and falling and falling. I knew I was going to fall forever. 
Well, clearly she didn't fall forever because she's back here. Um, but the majority of the ones I've heard is people, I think it was because they feel like I'm not worthy and or there's, they're feeling fear and they get what they project out for temporarily. But then they're always saved. And two I can think of in particular, uh, there was a doctor who was an anesthesiologist. He was a Hindu and he had his near-death experience and he felt himself like a hellish type place. It was really wild. His father came and took him out, saved him in his in his near death state. And then he went to bliss. Uh, Howard Storm's another one I can think of. And he found himself being tormented by these demons and they were, you know, picking at him and all this stuff. But then he, he prayed and Jesus came and took him out. Um, so in every one I've found, it's like been like, I, I'm in this place for a, temp a very temporary time. And then I was taken out. So I do believe that we can put ourselves in hellish states after we pass. I don't think we should be concerned about it um, because really, I think, I don't think we should be concerned about it. Let's just put it that way. I think that, again, most people find themselves making an easy transition. And even if our transition is a little bit difficult, we're never left alone. Someone's always going to come help us. And while I think sometimes people refuse that help for a period of time, eventually everybody will take it. So it sounds like there can be a hellish experience, but it's only temporary. It's not an eternal burning in hell. I think there can be. Yeah, I, I, I think there can be. But again, I think it's pretty rare. Um, and, and so people will say things like suicides go to hell. There's a, a movie called No Solar and the guy in his in his philosophy, theology, whatever, anybody that that took their own life goes goes to hell. I don't I don't believe that. And my experience has been I know again, people that have talked to people, mediums, have said no, they they get more love than anybody. You know, they're they're met right away. Sometimes they go to rehab, you know, they go to a hospital type of setting or something like that, or a boot camp, but not not to hell. Um, there's no punishment. There's no someone is throwing you somewhere. That no, not at all. What's the most important lesson that you think you've learned from studying near-death experiences, the afterlife, different religions? What is the 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 biggest life-changing meaning that you can pull from that? I'd say it's like we talked about earlier that all is one, that that it's all love. We're all love. It's all it's all about love. Um, that's what people that have had near-death experiences uh, have, have told me that the place that we're in now is is great. We should we should love it. We should cherish it, but it's not our ultimate reality. It's not our ultimate home. And that everything is okay. Uh, I, I interviewed a woman. She said she learned three things from her near death experience. She said everything is okay. Um, therefore, everything will be okay. Therefore, everything is okay, and that you're more loved than you can possibly imagine. And if we remember those three things for everything that we're going through, then we can get through anything. And if my viewers wanted to reach out to you or find you to watch your podcast, how can they find you? Uh, my website is grief to growth.com. So it's grief numeral to growth.com. Uh, that's also the name of my podcast. Um, if you go to my website, I have a community that I invite people to join. It's, it's free to join. Uh, so if you, if you like this type of stuff, you can join my community. Um, it's grief to growth.com slash community. Um, so I'd, I'd be glad to have people there. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Brian. You have been amazing. Uh, so full of knowledge and wisdom, and I appreciate your time and sharing, sharing all that you've learned and it's just been enlightening for me. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And 
I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.